Thanks for checking out this movie review video. This is for the 2020 film, The Invisible Man. This is the one that was put out by Blumhouse, and I'm about to get into it, but I'll tell you right now up front, I am going to do spoilers on this one. Usually I don't do spoilers on the newer films, but for this one, I feel like you kind of have to talk about it. Um, yeah, not talking about specifics on this would just be something that would kill me, basically, because I have problems with this film, and I also have things I really like about this film. So, if you haven't seen it yet, I would say stop this. Go watch it because I do think it's actually worth a watch. Uh, one time, in my opinion, uh, but that's just my personal opinion. So, um, yeah, I'm going to get into it. I'm going to break it down, what I liked, what I didn't like. Let's get into it. This is written and directed by Lee Wanell. I'm a fan of Lee Wanell. I like him as a person. Uh, I love him from back in the Saw days. I remember watching the first Saw film and just being mesmerized by it. The twist in that is unbelievably amazing. Uh, so he's a directed, written and directed such films as Insidious Chapter 3 and Upgrade. Those are ones that he directed. He directed those two. And he wrote Saw, Saw 2, Saw 3, Dead Silence, which I don't think is as bad as everyone says it is. Uh, Insidious, Insidious 2, Chapter 2, Insidious Chapter 3, Insidious The Last Key, Cooties, which is a pretty fun film, and Upgrade, which a lot of people slept on Upgrade, by the way, and I thought that was quite a good movie. That was also put out by Blumhouse, and that's a Lee Wanell film. Um, and I did see some parallels between the directing style in Upgrade and the directing style in The Invisible Man, specifically the portion in the mental hospital where that's like the fight scene. There were some things that he did with the camera at that point that were very, very reminiscent of Upgrade. So if you like this film at, at, at all, or you're a Lee Wan L fan and you haven't seen Upgrade, definitely check that out. It's worth, it's definitely worth it. So this stars Elizabeth Moss, who, by the way, does an excellent job in this. She is a really good actress. She does a really good job with this role. I think in general in this film, the acting is very well done. I didn't see any line delivery or actual physical acting that I was just like, oh, that's bad or that's questionable. It was all very well done. But she stands out, obviously, because she's the main character. And she has a tough role because she's got to play this. She's got to walk this line of, like, seeming... Um, believable and, f you know, afraid and fearing for her life and everything, but also seeming a little bit, you know, unhinged, a little bit crazy. And she's got to walk that line really well, but she does such a good job with it. She's been in films such as Suburban Commando. Didn't think I was going to mention that. Girl Interrupted. She was in a bunch of episodes of The West Wing. She was in a bunch of episodes of Mad Men. She was in the movie Us, which I think is quite a good film. You should definitely check that out. And most recently, she was very well known for her role in The Handmaid's Tale, which was a Hulu original series, which I haven't watched yet, but I do want to, I, w I do, I, I do want to, I'll get to it eventually. It's on one of my giant lists of to watch. So this had a $7 million budget and cha-ching, cha-ching, cash cow, it made $131.1 million at the box office. That's awesome for Blumhouse. Very cool. Uh, this film was actually originally supposed to be part of the Universal Monsters kind of revival that they did. They're calling it like the Dark Universe, uh, Universal, and uh, it was actually supposed to star Johnny Depp way back. But uh, that film got killed in its in that iteration because The Mummy with Tom Cruise did horrible at the box office. I haven't seen the film, but from what I hear, the biggest issue was they focused so much on just Tom Cruise and his character and not enough on the actual mummy, which is the title character. So uh, people just hated it. Apparently it was, wasn't was really well done. So they were, they were planning on having that be the kickoff to this whole dark universe. Uh, and they were going to do tons of films. They were going to do Dracula, I think Frankenstein, The Invisible Man, all sorts of things. Um, and they were already, you know, lining these things up. And like I said, Johnny Depp was, was on standby to be the invisible man, but that got killed after the poor performance by the mummy. And then Blumhouse stepped in much later and they were like, Hey, you know, we'd be interested in doing this. And then that's why you get the invisible man that you just got. So apparently just this month, I'm recording this in July of 2020, just this month it was announced that Lee Wanell is actually working on a sequel to The Invisible Man, which with the end of this, I'm interested to see where he's going to take it. Now, from the articles I had read, he kind of, uh, it seemed that he was noncommittal, kind of, it sounded like he didn't want to make a sequel, but then when it did so well, 
he was like, okay, you know, I feel like the fans dictated it. Like, I got to do this. Plus, Blumhouse is probably like, here's a fat paycheck. Let's do another one. And he's like, yes, I like money. <laughs> Just saying. Uh, the opening portion of this film actually could indicate love. I think it's very interesting because when she's in bed and she pulls back the covers and she's about to sneak out, you don't really know what's going on yet. And you see that his arm is around her. And she kind of like, you know, is trying to get out from under it. Now that could indicate v some very extreme love. But in this instance, it actually indicates in like being overly possessive, being very controlling. And it's interesting because that same image can be seen a few different ways. And it could go both ways. So I just kind of like how they, they started with that. Uh, the other thing I really like about this is you see the lengths to which Cecilia is going to get away from this guy, giving you a very clear indicator of how terrible this person is, how bad her situation really is that she's trying to get out of, that she has done this much planning, that she is going to these lengths in order to get out of there. And I think it, the way they do it is really good. They keep from doing a lot of, of music at that point, which helps a lot. Uh, I'm a big proponent of use silence to the best effect, and I think they did that really well, especially in the beginning of this. But there are other points during this film throughout that they use silence extremely well to ratchet up tension. It works really well. Now, this beginning scene where they're doing that uh, comes to a head when, obviously, she gets in the car and she takes off. Well, is about to take off, and he, like, punches the window. Adrian punches the window out. Uh, that's a cool moment that they kind of, you know, it's a bit of a jump scare. It's intense. It's intense. It takes it to the final conclusion of showing you, yes, what you were thinking about this guy when she's trying to leave is accurate. He is really this crazy. He's really this controlling. He's an evil guy. I mean, they establish that very, very quickly. Uh, the house is insane. Let me say that real quick. That house is amazing. I would love to live there. I would love to own that house. I'd love to just do that as like an Airbnb, have one night there. That house is amazing. Just a little side note there. So the two weeks later, you can actually see the level of trauma that Cecilia is kind of struggling with and dealing with at that point. Uh, it's best shown where, you know, she's trying to go out to the uh, mailbox and she like freaks out uh, and gets scared because there's a runner, a jogger in the neighborhood. Now, at this point, she doesn't even know that Adrian is actually still alive, but it, things have been so ingrained in her mind and is so traumatic that she just feels like he's around, you know, that, that someone's out to get her. And that that's a legitimate thing. I'll talk a little bit about that later, like at the very, very end. The little moment of lawyer when he says, well, the lawyer, Adrian's brother, when he says that Adrian's in the room with them was a cool kind of nod to what was going on. But they did a, a relatively good job of kind of playing it off like, um, oh my gosh, he knows that he's there. And then switching it where he mentions the urn and then you're just like, oh, that's kind of funny that they have it like that. But you end up finding out later, obviously, that he actually did know and he was actually involved in this plan and everything. And um, it's, I think that his character should have been pulled back a bunch, the brother, the lawyer brother, because I started to feel not long after the first interaction with him that he was involved, that he did know what was going on because of the way the character was played. The way his character was, he was too villainous. He was too smarmy. You know what I mean? Like they, they should have downplayed that character. Then it would have been a much better, more shocking moment towards the end when you find out that he was actually in the suit and he was all in on this. Even, even take it back from that. It would have been even better when he just showed up at the mental hospital and proposed that deal to her of, you know, you have this baby and everything's good. Um, but, you know, there are times in movies where the acting style or the dialogue, it telegraphs what's actually happening with the character. And I felt like that kind of happened with the lawyer brother. I'm not naming him because I just can't remember. <laughs> Uh, the breakfast fire is kind of like the first like post-mortem mo action from Adrian, which I think was a pretty good way to kind of like slowly introduce that uh, and have it be like his first thing. But they made it very obvious that, you know, he's doing it because the shot stays on it very, very long. Uh, there's no room for really um, second guessing what happened there because you actually see that when she's away from the stove, it actually gets turned on on high and then it goes to the fire, which I think it goes to the fire 
too fast, but that's fine because, you know, got to speed things up. Especially because, I'm going to say this right now, this movie's runtime is too long. It definitely should have been cut down. There's no reason for this film to be two hours. Well, technically over two hours with the credits, but it should have been edited down. It, it's too long. It's definitely too long. Uh, so we got to a point where we were 30 minutes into the film and nothing really had happened with post-mortem post, -mort post -mortem, uh, Adrian. And it felt like, where are we going? Like, when are we going to introduce this? It kind of slowed down too much. But once they started introducing more stuff, it started really picking up and things got going, thankfully. Um, I did really like the moment in particular where she steps outside and sh you see her breath in the cold and then you see his breath kind of like behind her and to the side. That was a really cool and chilling moment, if you will, pun intended in that case. But uh, I like that moment. I think it looks really good. It is chilling. It definitely is like a chilling moment where you're just like, oh, she's in some real danger. The guy she interviews with, this is a very small part, but I want to kind of point this out because it's important. The guy she ends up interviewing with for that job where she, you know, doesn't have her sketches, uh, he, he immediately has this chauvinism about him. And I think it's kind of telegraphing or talking about, you know, what kind of chauvinism there is, especially in male dominated workplaces when he makes a, a comment very early on about her appearance, about her being in Paris. And, you know, he's like, oh, is it mandatory for all beautiful women to go to Paris after they graduate? And it's just, it's such, it hits you as such an odd comment because she's there for a interview. He doesn't know her and her looks are not part of the job. So it's just this, this extra moment of male chauvinist, there's yet another little bit of what Adrian is in a massive amount scattered throughout the world that she will continue to interact with, have to interact with. I was wondering when they would end up addressing the bottle of pills. Uh, it happens mm, maybe like 40, 45 minutes into the film, and I kept thinking about when are the pills coming into play, when are the pills coming into play, because they made a very specific point of showing that she drops the pills before she got into that car that she used for the getaway. Um, so when they finally show up, I was like, oh, okay, there they are. So that's cool. You can't blame anyone for not believing Cecilia because it seems like an insane situation to be like, oh, this guy was invisible, you know? Um, so for that reason, you, you really do understand when no one will actually believe her. Like, you want them to believe her for, for the st standpoint of, you know, rooting for her character. But when you step back and actually look at the story, like, you can't fault any of these people for actually not believing her because... It seems so implausible, but I think that's part of the problem with what what they're trying to say is kind of one of one of the problems with you know abusive relationships, controlling relationships, is that when people think they know the other person involved in the relationship, whether they're a friend or family member or whatever, and they're not willing to listen to what the person being controlled or abused is saying, it's because they just feel like it's so far fetched. They're like I know this person, it's so far fetched. There's there's no way they would be like that. But here's the thing: people are different inside and outside of relationships. And it's definitely one of these things where the view from the outside is definitely different from the view from the inside, always pretty much, you know, whether that's positive or negative, it goes both ways. But in the abusive variety and the controlling variety, usually people don't let people outside of a relationship actually see that. Uh, they present themselves in a much different way, especially people like Adrian, who are very psychopathic, who kind of put on this facade of being a normal person, a very good person, a caring person. Uh, but then when he's alone with this person he's trying to control, he is his true terrible self. So the fact that the he is invisible when he's out in public and he's not invisible when he's with her mainly, um, it's, it, it's a good way of kind of tying those two things in, of outside of the relationship who he truly is, is invisible. Inside of the relationship, you can see it. So I think it's cool that the film was done that way. You can see Adrian slowly trying to isolate Cecilia from people around her, which this is exactly what really controlling people and abusive people do in relationships. They seek to isolate that person from friends and family and just have them themselves be 
their sole lifeline, be the sole person that they come to and depend on for everything. And that way it ensures complete control. They can control the narrative of what the person thinks, what the person does, all that stuff. So as he's, you know, manipulating things in her world post-mortem, post-mortem, um, it's very true to how abusive and controlling people are in relationships. So I think it was good that they did it that way too. Um, the paint scene looked really cool, by the way. That was really cool when she was in the attic and she had a feeling that he was on the um, on the the uh, ladder up to the attic and she dumped the paint on him and you could see a little bit of him for a moment. That looked really cool, that splash of paint. Also, to point out, the suit, that invisibility suit, the design of it is really cool. It looks really good. And the parts where it's like getting glitchy looks so good. They did a really good job with the effects on this. So I was very, very happy with that. It's funny that as Cecilia runs from the house with the first, you know, stint of uh, run-ins she has with Adrian being invisible, she runs from the house and she's looking behind her as she runs. You know, obviously that's a situation where it's like, just something that is uh, instinct to do that, to be like, oh my God, are they getting closer or not? But there's no reason for her to be looking back because she can't see him. So I just think that's kind of funny to watch and realize that, even though there is a legitimate reason for her to be doing that. It's just instinct. Uh, the scene where Adrian slits Emily's throat, um, Cecilia's sister, I think is actually really poorly done. I did not like this scene. I don't think it plays well. It plays very oddly. I even stopped and rewound it and rewatched it. Uh, there are a few things that really bother me about this. One, nobody saw this hovering knife. Somebody would have seen this hovering knife, most likely. The other thing is, if there were any, it, because apparently everyone and everything in this film has um, cameras, uh, if they looked at the camera footage, they would have seen a hovering knife. But anyway, nobody sees this hovering knife. I guess maybe we can, you know, get past that because it was like, pretty quick but then after her throats gets gets slit how is it that it the knife then ends up in cecilia's hand that way because there's no way he could physically do it that fast because her throat gets slit and then it immediately goes to cecilia's hand that's very unbelievable and that scene does not work at all for that reason you know he would have had to slit her throat and then there would have been a lot of fumbling to get her hand to take that thing because she needs to do stuff with her hand. He can't just pull her whole arm up with one hand and then stick the knife in it and do this in that amount of time. And it wouldn't even be that smooth. So that seems terrible. They, I, I understand what they're trying to do there and they could have done it in a much different way. So they really should have done something better. That looked awful. It It's a plot hole basically. I don't like that scene. I think it doesn't work. It's bad. Um, so that's one of my big gripes with this film. The fight scenes, like I was talking about, the fight scenes in the mental hospital, good, good, good. Um, once again, reminds me a lot of the directing and cinematography and Upgrade. Check it out. Uh, and the suit glitches are great at that point. Uh, when the guy crashes his car, this is another thing I have a problem with. It's very small, but I have a problem with this. When Cecilia is out of the mental hospital and... Um, Adrian's getting away, and this guy just randomly crashes his car. Okay, you know, first of all, the fact that some guy just happens to crash his car. Okay, a little too convenient. Then the fact that the guy immediately gets out of the car, and she's going at the car. He doesn't even acknowledge that she's there, and then she takes the car and goes. It's one of those moments where I roll my eyes when these things happen, because it's way too convenient to move the story forward. It's not good writing at that point. Now, that said, there's a lot of good writing in this. So a moment here or there, it's not the biggest deal, but I feel while I'm breaking these films down, it's important for me to point these things out that are problematic, especially because you don't just do everything in one take and then edit it once and then you're done. People looked at this, so they should have realized, eh, this doesn't really work. It just seems a little too weird. I do like the twist of the brother being the one that she ends up shooting. When she thinks she's shooting, shooting Adrian, and then she takes the mask off, and it is the lawyer brother. I think that was a nice twist. I didn't see it coming, so I really quite like that. Uh, then further, I, I do to a degree like the twist of her plan to make it look like 
Adrian actually ends up killing himself and the way she sets things up I like that but the way it was actually done it goes back to the scene I was complaining about in the restaurant with the throat slitting the sit you have the same problems here it's not believable it's terribly shot um it, it just doesn't work it's the same thing it's it, here are the two things um well actually there's a few I, this is what I wrote down as the, the problems with this it's a cool idea it's a great idea and I really like that twist to it they just needed to do it in a different way um, I don't think she'd be able to overpower him. I really don't, especially because I don't think she'd be able to silently get in there unless we're making the assumption that this suit has some sort of like noise dampening technology. Okay, let's just assume that. I, I don't think he'd be she'd be able to overpower him like that because we've already established that he's pretty strong throughout the film. They've made that a very big point. So I don't think she could overpower him. Uh, I don't think she could uh, get the knife into his hand the way she did. That's part of the overpowering, but also just to like move it. And it's it, it goes back to the scene in the restaurant. Like you can't just like seamlessly get a knife in someone's hand and then make them slit their throat. Like you can't do that. It's not that seamless. It's not that smooth. It doesn't work. It's It's very unrealistic. The other thing is, how is she doing this? I assume she's using the suit that the lawyer brother had on, but here's the problem with that. It had bullet holes in it. It wasn't working properly. It had holes in it. So even if for some reason it actually worked, it wasn't glitching out, even though it had bullet holes in it, it still has holes in it. So you could see that there was something there. So, plot hole. This does not work. This doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. And I, and that ticked me off because, once again, just like I was saying with the scene in the restaurant, good idea, but there you could do it a different way, and you should have done it a different way. Same thing here. Great idea, actually, with getting the revenge, with making it look like he killed himself, but you have to do it a different way. It wasn't done well. It was not done well. And that creates a big problem with this film for me. All right, so all that, the events of it done. The score serves the film quite well. I really enjoyed the score. I thought it was really good. Uh, and there are stints of silence, like I was saying before, that do a great job in ratcheting up the tension. That's great. It looks really good. Uh, directing, really good. Cinematography, really good. Acting, like I talk about, very good, especially from Moss. She did an excellent job. The two-hour runtime is a problem. It is very unnecessary. It should have been cut down. This film does drag for that reason. It does need to be kind of slow because of what's happening in the film and how you have to kind of develop it, but there's a lot of stuff that, that could have been cut down a bit. Uh, Two-hour runtime, it's just too much. The idea of tying the Invisible Man concept to an abusive relationship and what it does to people is smart. This was a great idea. This was a great concept. I really liked it. Much like the trauma that follows a person the invisible tormentor won't go away, is what I wrote down. That's a very good point. Um, it's a good representation of even if someone can get out of that physical situation with that relationship, there's always that invisible tormentor following you or that specter of that person following you in life uh, as, as that invisible trauma, which you cannot see but you have to deal with. So I like that aspect of it. Um, it also goes to point out that... Uh, this is a, tr a real life thing. Victims of, for example, the Golden State Killer, um, he perpetrated many rapes, and some of his rape vi victims have publicly made statements about feeling like they can't ever take it easy. They can't not look over their shoulders. They can't sleep because they feel like someday he'll come back. Now, maybe that's a bit different now because he's actually been caught uh, and been found guilty, but when he was out there, they, the trauma just would not let it go. So this is a real thing, and I think it's represented well in the film. I don't like that some things are seen in the film, and then there's actually dialogue to tell you that that happened uh, and what's happening in the film. Um, you know, some people are fine with that. I'm not. It's just a personal thing for me. I feel like it makes me feel like the, the director, the filmmaker, thinks that the audience is dumb. Um, you can show us things. Don't tell us things. Uh, it, it just happens a few times, you know, like, um, I can't think of any 
there were at least two moments in particular in the film, but I can't recall them at the moment. I should have taken notes on them. Like, I'll remember, but then I don't remember. But it's just one of those things, like, show, don't tell, you know. But they didn't do it a lot, so, you know, just the few moments that they did, it was like, eh. So, now comes something that I, I really don't like about this film. The title. This film could have had so much more impact and have been so much better and been more surprising had it not been named The Invisible Man. By calling it The Invisible Man, people know exactly what they're going to end up with. It takes a lot of the mystery away from it that I feel like the film was actually trying to put there. And it works against the film for the audience. And that sucks. If they would have called it something else, just say they called it, you know, I don't know, relationship or something like that. Just not, not that that's a good title, just to say something other than the invisible man, say it's called relationship and it, it's the exact same film. You would go through a, a long stint of time in this film where you're questioning whether or not Adrian is actually invisible or not. And actually you would probably believe that he's not invisible, that she's losing her mind, that the trauma is driving her crazy. And that's a more powerful film. And then it becomes even more powerful when you find out that he is invisible. The issue with this is that you already know that there's going to be an invisible man in it. And I think that kills a lot of the surprise, a lot of the twist to it. I think this film could have been amazingly good had it not been called The Invisible Man. I mean, I understand why they did it because of the property, because I think it actually also would have, you know, probably got more sales that way, but... It would have been a better film if it wasn't called The Invisible Man. Anyway, interested to hear people's thoughts on that. Put your comments down there. Anything you want to talk about with this film, though. Uh, Going to give it a rating. So, out of five stars with half stars in play, this is a tough one for me. I'm between three and three and a half stars. Because, um, obviously, there's some things I really don't like about this film. But there's some things that are really good and really work here. So, I think I'm going to... I'm going to be fair. I'm going to go three and a half stars on this. This is actually a pretty solid film. I would recommend people see it once. I don't think it really warrants rewatches, especially because of the two hour runtime. But, you know, uh, interested in hearing other people's thoughts. But thanks everyone for checking this out. Real quick, do me a favor, hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. That's your way to repay me. It literally takes a second and it means a lot to me and my channel. I would really appreciate that. If you already have subscribed or you're going to, make sure you hit the notification bell. That way you know anytime I'm putting up new videos or doing a live stream. But regardless, I appreciate you stopping by and checking this out. And until next time, keep it brutal.